if uh, I want to thank everyone for being here. I think we have uh, it's seven o two, and we have a lot of people online. So I'm I'm happy to start. Um, the uh, I want to introduce you and invite you all to be happy and healthy and enjoy our evening. I'm Siska's vice president, and I'm the MC tonight because Alan is off on a kayak trip. He waited patiently until the uh, restart plan, um, and he's on a level one trip, so he's up up island. And uh, uh, I think they're uh, hopefully they're having a good time. Um, I have a few announcements here. First, we really want to thank everyone who participated in our spring training workshops. Um, I have to say that the reports from US members that participated in them, the evaluations, as well as the feedback that we've had from the trainers has been just excellent. And uh, um, the, it was incredibly well subscribed. So uh, we just want to thank everyone who came out, um, who had a chance to really learn something new or revive, refresh some skills. Now, this is our last meeting uh, before September 22nd. We don't meet for the summer. So this will be our last members meeting. And maybe, hopefully, we've got our fingers crossed by September 22nd, we may be able to meet in person. And I'm looking forward to that, as I'm sure a lot of you are. The other thing is uh, uh, the Citadel has decided permanently not to rent to any outside groups. So we are looking for an alternative location for our monthly meetings and our training sessions in the fall. If you have any ideas, please email either Ellen or myself because we're really starting to explore what type of facility we can find that's central, large enough to fit everyone in, has parking, can fit a few kayaks on top of cars in the parking lot, and that's something we'll be looking at. So if you have any idea of a good location, I say, please let us know. And uh, uh, the um, Cisca, um, if you note on our website and also in the most recent um, newsletter, um, a number of the, um, our commercial partners are offering kayak skills and multi-day training discounts for Cisco members. So if you're looking at a hosted trip or some training, some further training, uh, you um, look at the, on our website or on these websites and you may find that you have, uh, you can get a discount as a Cisco member. Uh, now, uh, BJ, I'm going to invite you to talk about the uh, June 8th, 10th shoreline cleanup. Okay, I am now unmuted. Thumbs up if you can hear me. Yes. Good. Sorry about that. I thought that I would be unmuted when I took the floor. Okay, uh, there was a website called the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. And World Oceans Week is coming up, as a lot of you probably know. And because Cisco has not yet taken on a whole lot of kind of environmental um, sort of roles, uh, I know individually many of us are involved, but I have set up three shoreline cleanups during World Oceans Week. It's on the website that I just cited, the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. And there are three of them to choose from, one on June 8th, one on June 9th and one on June 10th. And June 9th is actually World Oceans Day specifically. So it's not too much of an investment in time, probably, you know, launching, 
maybe three hours of cleanup and then back to the launch site. Uh, I don't want to take up a lot of time right now, so you can go to the Great Canadian Ocean's uh, shoreline cleanup and sign up for Cisco 1, 2, or 3, and those are written out, so O-N-E-T-W-O and T-H-R-E-E. -E. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for organizing that, BJ. It's a, a start, we hope, of a of a real Cisco uh, stewardship initiative. Next, I'd like to invite Dorothea uh, to talk about the ROMs. And Dorothea, you're muted still. So, so far, I, we have had one romp last night which was attended by three people. And I have two more planned, which you've already seen emails from. I'm hoping that I might uh, continue the romps through the end of August this year. Although I'm going to have, in mid June, I'm going to be unable to have romps. But if you need, would like to have something, if there's something that we would like to see happen in particular, you can, uh, contact me at kayakcourses at shaw.ca. That's all. Thanks very much. And now um, we're doing really well. We're quite a bit ahead of schedule. Um, and I hope John is on the line. John Comantis, are you here? I'm here. Great, wonderful. And Lynn, you're, you're on mute. Okay, um, I'm just giving a quick presentation on behalf of BC Marine Trails. And um, I'm gonna share a little presentation that I did up for um, a workshop that we did previously. And let's see if I can pop it up here. Do, 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 do. Give me a moment to um, get set up here. And the reason for presenting this to you folks is to, um, just make you aware of this program that we're working on for um, BC Marine Trails, uh, what we're doing, why we're doing, how we're doing it, in the hopes that a few people there will be uh, inspired to take part because um, it, uh, it just needs people in order to um, do something quite um, uh, fulfilling, I think, which is completing the marine trail system for the British Columbia coast. Um, so this is adopted from workshop I gave. I'm just gonna breeze through it quickly. Uh, what we're doing um, through BC Marine Trails is trying to create a system that's optimized for safety. And so it's working on a few principles that we've established. And the basic one is that um, two campsites should ideally be within eight nautical miles of one another, uh, but no farther apart than 12 nautical miles. So there's a bit of flexibility right there. Um, in addition to that, we've got concept of safety stock. So if we have uh, two sites that are eight nautical miles apart, we should have a safety stop uh, in between. And a safety stop should be never farther than five nautical miles from any site. So there's some flexibility that's built into that so that we can actually have um, 10 nautical miles between two campsites with a uh, safety stop halfway in between and still be within our optimal safety mandate. So uh, basically there's a great deal of flexibility. We're implementing this on the discoveries in Mid-Island Coast region uh, this year in large part because we've been doing our First Nations engagement um, strategy in this area. And so we've got good ongoing relationships with um, all the First Nations uh, in this area, which is quite phenomenal. It's been a really, really successful program. And so what we're getting through that is the social license from First Nations to be able to use sites, basically sites that have been cleared for First Nations cultural and archeological considerations, uh, which is a huge victory because we're way farther ahead on that process than even BC Parks is at this point in time. Um, so I can't say enough good things about that. So this is the area we're concentrating upon for 2021. So it's essentially north of Campbell River and Lund um, up to Port Hardy. Um, so anywhere in this area. And so what that looks like in terms of a marine trail system is if you connect all the dots, these are essentially the routes that we're looking at completing. So we're looking at implementing the safety mandate along all these blue lines. Um, unfortunately, 
Uh, well, actually, and then once, um, in addition to that, if you overlay uh, an optimal um, uh, routing, uh, this is what it looks like. Basically, we could complete the marine trail system through this region with about 180 sites. Uh, it's not incredibly difficult to complete, uh, which is the encouraging thing about it. Basically, um, it's a very realistic goal all of a sudden uh, to complete it this. So this is sort of a, a, um, a perfect picture of what the um, marine trail would look like if it's complete. Um, it doesn't look like that right now. What we've got is a huge inventory of sites uh, in our database, uh, but they're not configured to any safety mandate. So they're just a hodgepodge of sites located all around the coast. Um, and the other difficulty that we face with BC Marine Trails is that two thirds of the sites um, are not shown to the public because they're not assessed. We don't know if they're suitable sites. Basically, it means there are 2000 plus sites um, that are question marks. Uh, and so we don't know if they are usable or not, if they apply for the marine trail system, uh, what their status is. And so um, there's a bit of work to be done. So in terms of taking these um, lines and these dots that we had uh, and taking a closer look, uh, we can see that we've got marine trail sites that show up um, uh, it, and not necessarily in relation to any particular locations where they were on the map. So basically these blue dots here uh, are the same blue dots that are showing up here. So these are where the sites should be located ideally uh, within a range. Uh, and these are the sites that we've got. So what we've been doing at BC Marine Trails is packaging um, optimal potential locations, uh, sort of taking a look at what sites can be grouped into what area that fills the safety mandate. So here we've got a perfect match. Uh, this is the Birdwood group. Um, and uh, it's just, um, it's a formal site. And if somebody commutes, they're getting some accordion music in the background here. Um, we've got a perfect match here. Um, it's a formal site uh, with uh, in a provincial park that fits perfectly with our safety mandate. But there are other locations along here too, where yeah, you know, we've got a site. We've got a, um, uh, uh, a site is needed and a site is available all through this route. So we've got a, a potential here that we might actually be able to connect the dots with what we've got already. Um, but you can see there's other locations here where there are um, sites needed. And there is a site there, but it hasn't been assessed yet. So we don't know if it's suitable or not. And then we get into areas uh, like this particular polygon here, where there's a couple of sites tucked off in the corner, but it's really not optimally located. So basically what we're gonna have to do is scour this section of coast uh, and see what's there. So basically our situation is right now, uh, we know what we need, we know what we, uh, where we need it, uh, we know what sites needs to be assessed, uh, and we know the areas of coast where we don't know uh, where any sites are, but we need one. So we've basically got a shopping list right now. Um, and so what we're trying to do is recruit people who uh, can go out uh, and do a site assessment uh, at, uh, at these locations and just scout them out for us and get this done. So we're reaching out in the hopes that uh, people will be motivated to plan a trip um, around uh, these particular polygons. So we've been going through this, uh, a workshop process with people to get them trained as assessors because um, there is particular information that we need about these sites when people go out, uh, whether they're going to be suitable or not. So we've been walking people through a process. Um, it's not particularly complicated. You could actually do an assessment probably within an hour uh, at each site. Uh, so it's not a huge burden to go out and, and do these. Um, getting there might be tough, but if you're in an area of the coast for a kayaking trip, um, it would be huge to be able to contribute and help finish the marine trail system for us in the coast. Um, I think there's about uh, 45 priority polygons where we need to find a site uh, and uh, get people out to do assessments there. So it's very, very achievable. We could potentially have the framework for a marine trail system by the end of the summer. Uh, and if we do, we can take that to First Nations, uh, work with them on the site selection that we've got, uh, and potentially get approval for them all and be done to the minimal uh, standards required for optimal safety. Um, that's our goal at this point in time. Uh, and so um, 
think about it. And if you're, uh, if this uh, is of any interest to you, if you're planning a trip out to any of these areas or want to plan a trip, um, get in contact with me uh, or Fred, who's um, on here tonight, or Jean as well. I saw that she was on. Um, anybody else within BC Marine Trails or anybody else within Cisco, pass on the information to um, to us on your interests. Um, and hopefully, we'll hear from a few people. Thank you very kindly. Thanks very much, John. Uh, uh, it's an exciting thought to get back to that area. It's a beautiful part of the province. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you, I hope you, I hope you hear from, from someone. Now we're going to turn this over to Roger for the prize draw. Uh, he's going to select two winners of our Cisco prize from those who are online. And we want to thank Mike Gilbert, who's donated one of the prizes. And just check my notes here. So, uh, oh, it looks like he's donated both prizes. Okay. Uh, so, anyway, so Mike Gilbert, uh, we have a nice ball cap, and we have a deck. Well, it's called a deck pod, which looks like it attaches up to your deck. Looks really nice, and uh, I'm sure every every kayaker could use that. So let's see if we can find somebody. Yes. Is the thing winning? Uh, oh, now it tells me winner, but it doesn't say who. Oh. Uh, what would a Vivian? Does that Zora be online? No? I guess we'll have to find somebody else. How about Bob McKechnie? McKechnie. Yes, hello. You're online. Good. <laughs> what a winner. <laughs> that was You've got this deck pod and you got a ball cap. Yeah, deck pod, please. Well, both of them, actually. Oh, oh. oh we're getting both. Okay. So let me write this down so I don't forget because I have a volatile memory. That's Bob Mc... uh... McKechnie, yeah. Yeah. I... You got to spell it. It's an ethnic name. M-C-K-E-C-H-N-I-E. -E. Oh, there we go. M-C-H. H M I E. Thank you. And, uh, we'll get a hold of you and find some way to get this to you. Thank you. Now, for the other prize, and I've been trying to give this thing away for several months, we have a genuine Northwater micro tow line you know, required by Transport Canada to be on your boat or something like that. And well, let's find out who is going to hopefully finally win this thing. Michael Callahan, are you online? No, Michael Callahan? Nope. Okay, let's try again. How about Michael Hunza? Uh, no? And how nice they look. Look at that. Wow. Really? Let's try again. Well, I know this person online is Lynn Beak. <laughs> so you better be online. Yes, I'm online. All right. And I do know how to get all of you. Mm hmm So you have a tow line. Great. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. And uh and I hope I'll never need to use it. I hope everyone stays safe on the water. Yes, we hope that. And the crowd goes wild. <laughs> yep. So okay, that's the end of my duties. On to the next person. Mm hmm Thank you. So uh, now I'd like to introduce our presenter for tonight. And uh, this is 
and I really hope I'm doing reasonably well on your name. It's Karan Tanjavur. He is from University of Victoria and he's an astronomer. Um, he was raised um, in a small town in South India and he completed his education um, up to the bachelor's level as a mechanical engineer. Then he, his life took a dramatic turn when he decided to leave engineering and uh, uh, pursue teaching new skills to underprivileged youth in remote parts of Zambia, Africa. He then later emigrated to Canada to do graduate studies, first in robotics and later in astrophysics. After his PhD from UVic, he worked as the resident astronomer at the Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope in Hawaii for three years. And then he returned to UVic to accept a position as a senior lab instructor in astronomy. I know I'm really looking forward to this presentation and I'm sure you are as well. Um, he, um, he is willing to take some questions that can't wait during the, the presentation, but I just want to let everyone know we will have time at the end for questions and answers. And now I'm happily going to turn it over to Karan. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, thank you all for, for this kind of invitation. It was nice to, to be a fly on the wall on, during your meeting because I, I love the outdoors as well. I'm more into the back country as a, as a hiker or a mountaineer. So it's nice to see how much more there is to explore on the oceans, you know? So I was telling Alan someday, I'd like to get out on a kayak with you all on a trip. So I look forward to an opportunity like that. Um, so thank you for, for this invitation to share my other passion, you know, studying the night sky and trying to understand what this universe is made of and what stories the, the objects we see in the sky carry. Um, and it was such a nice coincidence that uh, in the early hours of this morning, there was a spectacular lunar eclipse um, I emailed Alan the details and I was hoping that at least over Victoria we'll, you know, we'll have nice clear skies, but that was not to be, unfortunately. <laughs> but that's the life of an astronomer, you know, we're just tied to the weather as kayakers are and anybody who, is, who studies, uh, who enjoys the outdoors uh, is bound to be. But um, I was on a meeting just earlier uh, with a collaborator in Penticton. And he mentioned that till about 10 minutes before the lunar eclipse, the skies were overcast, but almost like magic, the skies cleared up. And he sent me a picture, which I'll share shortly. You know, when I share my screen, you'll actually get to see how beautiful that view was. And the other little thing that I'd like to share before my presentation is, uh, I work at UBIC, you know, in the physics and astronomy department. And as part of my job, I also do all the outreach activities for astronomy. And the one thing we've, we've done for many, many years now, you know, this predates my, uh, my joining the department, is to run what we call an open house, a public open house every Wednesday night. Uh, Pre-COVID, the observatory would be open, We'd set up telescopes. We have a group of very dedicated, keen undergraduate students who volunteer. And we invite the public to come and look through the telescopes and talk about astronomy, uh, look at the night sky. You know, hopefully it's a nice clear night. So uh, this fall, things will resume, hopefully with face-to-face -face visits again. And I would invite you all to, to come and use that opportunity to look up at the sky, you know, which is where you should be looking, you know, not listening to an online presentation, but actually seeing things in the sky. Uh, so that's Wednesday nights. Unfortunately, it kind of coincides with your club meetings, but I hope you can, if you can slip away for a Wednesday, please come to UVic, you know, the UVic Observatory in the Bob Wright building. So let me now share my screen. Uh, so I can probably share the whole desktop. 
And uh, here's the picture. I hope you can see the, the picture of the eclipse. You know, this is taken at Penticton. And uh, this is just, it was in the early hours of the morning, so just before moon set. And that was the totality. And as you can see, it's, it's really beautiful. And you can see the reddish hue uh, that is very typical of a total lunar eclipse. You know, this is just because the sunlight filters through the Earth's atmosphere and the dust particles in the Earth's atmosphere diffract, you know, they scatter, scatter away the blue light. So the only light that gets through to the moon, you know, through the atmosphere is that reddish end of the spectrum, which is why the, the moon appears reddish in color do, during a total eclipse. They call it the blood moon for that reason. Um, but there it is, you know, so really beautiful sight. So let me now go to my presentation itself. So I hope you're able to see my slides now. Um, great. Yeah, so um, I've uh, titled it as Navigating Through an Ocean of Stars. And, you know, as key navigators, you know, it has a double meaning because the, like the Polynesians, you know, people have used the stars to navigate, you know, so they've actually been a really amazing signposts in the sky for uh, ocean uh, travelers. And so what we are going to do today is actually navigate through an understanding of these stars. You know, when we look up at the sky, can we actually use it as a map to understand what it is that we are seeing up there? So um, when I gave this talk to the Alpine Club, you know, I pitched it as a rock climbers kind of a uh, story. And I used this uh, analogy with the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And when I was talking to Alan about it, he, he really enjoyed this book. And so I kept the slide. Um, and what I'm going to do today in my presentation is something like the Hitchhiker's Guide. You know, it's going to be a bit of a ramble of the nearby universe, you know, what, what it is that we see in the sky in the nearby universe, you know, so things that we can uh, see just using our naked eye. Uh, but of course, the universe extends far beyond that. So um, I'd like to start it as a story, you know, imagine you're out on a multi-day kayaking trip, you know, you had a great day on the waters and then you pull in your kayaks, you set up camp on a, on a beautiful beach in the back country. Um, and as you know, after your supper, you know, you're just sitting around and uh, the, in the early night you look up and this is probably what you'll see, you know, this, the sky filled with points of light, just a carpet of lights. And since, you know, uh, you'll be far from any city lights with no light pollution, the sky will be just filled with, with stars. And at times it's, it's almost overwhelming because there are, it's so bright and there are so many stars that it's almost impossible to orient yourself. You know, it's, it, uh, you're, you feel almost dizzy with that. And I remember you know, when I was an astronomer in Hawaii and uh, up at the observatories on Mauna Kea you know, at about uh, 5,000 meters, you can imagine how much clearer the night skies would be and how filled the stars were and it's, that's you know, not only because of the lack of oxygen, but also because of the sight. I would feel really literally dizzy just looking up at the sky then. You know? So it's the same kind of uh, awe-inspiring sight that you get when you look up at the night sky. So what I hope to do during uh, tonight's presentation is to kind of give you a little um, orienteering session or a, or a sky map so that the next time this happens, at least you'll be able to, to pick up a few or um, identify a few things of interest, you know, because quite often you wonder what it is that I'm looking and hopefully at the end of this today's presentation, you'll have, a, you'll have answers to a few of your questions. So um, just a, a list of some simple questions. You know, the first thing when you look, at, look up at the sky is it'll be nice to know where the cardinal directions are. And usually when you just look up at the sky, it's difficult to figure out you know, where north is. So what we'll do is we'll use the stars to guide us to, to these uh, cardinal directions. 
And I will explain why it is important to know where those directions are, because the next thing is you may see a bright uh, object in the sky and wonder, is that a star, a planet? Does it twinkle or not twinkle? Um, so I'll probably I'll try to tell you a way of identifying planets or where to find planets. And the other thing you'd like to know is, can I identify the constellations? You know, quite often we know a few constellations. Would we be able to identify those constellations and look for a star that we may have heard of? So again, I'll try to give you a few clues on how you may go about doing that. And as I mentioned, you know, there is of course, literally a universe out there to discover, you know, so I'll, I'll be hardly, barely scratching the surface during my presentation. There is much, much more to learn. And again, uh, I'd like to invite you to the open house where we can talk a little bit more about all these, all these things. So let's start off with the first question, you know, so which way is north um, or uh, any of these uh, cardinal points on the compass? So how do we identify north? Not by holding up your GPS or, you know, one of, or your fancy cell phone, but just by using the stars as they did back then, you know, the pollination navigators, how did they figure out where north was? And here in Victoria, you know, at 48 degrees north latitude, we have some excellent guides, you know, some very good guides in the sky with which we can very easily uh, pick out north. And uh, that's what I've shown here, um, naming the stars that uh, make the, this guide. And just to help uh, guide the eye, I've connected the dots using straight lines. Um, and this is what is commonly called the Big Dipper. You know, so I'm sure many of you have, uh, have know this um, and will be able to identify it. And what is nice about the Big Dipper is because it is very close to Polaris, the, the North Star, it stays in the sky throughout the night and throughout the year. You know, it is what we call a circumpolar set of stars. So it's always visible at these northern latitudes. And so this is a guide, unless it is clouded out, you know, you will be able to see in the sky at any time of the year. Unlike other constellations which rise and set, the, the Big Dipper, which is not a constellation, you know, I have to be a bit clear about that being an astronomer, I have to make all these distinctions. So it is what is called an asterism. You know, it is part of a bigger constellation called Ursa Major or Ursa Majoris. And it is what we call an asterism, just a collection of, of stars. Okay? But because of this very typical uh, shape, it is quite easy to identify. And these seven stars are easily visible to the naked eye. You know, they are what we call sixth magnitude or brighter. So all of them are very easily uh, visible. And because of the pattern, it's quite easy to identify as well. So the first thing you do to find north is figure out where the Big Dipper is. And once you've done that, take the two stars that form the, the bottom part of the, of the cup or the dipper, you know, the Merak and Dube, extend it, extend that line to about three fist widths, you know, approximately three fist widths and you'll come to a bright star, the first bright star in that line, and that is Polaris, the, the North Star, okay? uh, which is part of another constellation called Ursa Minor. Okay? So that's, and once you've identified North Star, that is your uh, geometric knot, you know, so it is not your magnetic knot, it is the spin axis of Earth. Okay, so that is the geometric knot, uh, and that is good enough. You know, so you've identified at least not. So if you stand facing with Polaris directly uh, in front of you, to your right is east, to your left is west, and behind you is south. So you've kind of oriented at least yourself to the to the four principal cardinal directions. So just a few things about Polaris. 
Okay, so we know that the Earth spins on its axis. The axis is tilted 23 and a half degrees. So it is not spinning straight up and down. It's kind of tilted uh, to, its, to the plane of its, uh, of its motion around the sun. And Polaris, you know, so if you extend the rotation axis of, of Earth, it seems to pass through Polaris, you know, which is why it, it, it is called the North Star. Okay? So that's, that's where a Polaris lies. So it lies along the rotation axis of Earth. And you may think, you know, because uh, in, um, in human terms, you know, distances are very small, we know that the Earth goes around the sun once a year. So you may wonder, is this Polaris along the Earth's axis at one point in its orbit? And as we go around to maybe six months later, will the axis be pointing at some other star? You know, will, will Polaris be the North Star only for part of, its, of the Earth's orbit and then change to some other point? And the answer is no. And that is because distances in astronomy are huge, you know, just way behind, beyond our human comprehension. And just to give you an idea of what the distance is, we use in astronomy, kilometers are just too tiny and unit for us to use for distance. So we use another unit called a light year, which is the distance light travels in one year. And just to give you a, a, a gauge of what the distance is, in one second, light travels 300,000 kilometers. And just to put it in context, that's about six times around the Earth in one second. And at that speed, you can calculate how long light will travel in a year. And I've written that number down at the bottom of the screen, you know, so um, it's, it's about, um, uh, Yeah, one, so it's about a trillion kilometers, I think. You know? So it's some huge number that I can't even remember. And in, in the, at that speed, light takes about eight minutes to travel from the sun to the earth. And at that speed, it'll take 325 to 425 years for light to travel from Polaris to earth. You know? So that's how far away Polaris is from Earth. So the movement around of the Earth around the sun makes absolutely no difference. So whichever point in the Earth's orbit you are, Polaris will, will seem to lie along the rotation axis of the sun, you know, so uh, of, the, of the Earth, you know, so it doesn't change during with the seasons. Polaris is the North Star throughout the year. Okay, so you don't have to worry about this, uh, the difference uh, in the rotation axis, in the direction of the rotation axis. So the other thing I'd like to point out is just like distances are just huge in astronomy, so are time scales. Okay? So um, in, in human terms, a, a hundred years seems like a long time, but in astronomy, millions, billions of years are the scales on which things change. And what is what we think is permanent is definitely not permanent because in astronomy everything changes nothing is fixed forever and the same thing with polaris and that is because the earth is not only spinning going around the sun but it is also what we call processing it, the rotation axis is kind of spinning around a third axis okay it's like a uh, like a top which is slowly spinning down and going to stop. You know, it, there is a wobble in the, in the Earth's orbit, in the Earth's uh, spin. And because of that, because of this wobble, the Earth's spin axis is now pointed to, towards Polaris, but back in, let's say 3000 BC, you know, when, when the Egyptians were building their pyramids, Polaris was not the North Star. It was a different star called Tuban, you know, which is in, uh, in the constellation Draconis. So that was the North Star. You know, back then the Earth's spin axis was pointed towards a different star. And in the year 14,000 AD, you know, so another 12 centuries uh, ahead, the Vega, which is one of the brightest stars in the Northern sky will be the, the North Star. Okay, so 
because of this precession, the Earth's rotation axis is kind of sweeping out a big circle and the stars which lie on that circle will be the North Star at different times. Okay, so of course we don't have to worry, worry about it, you know, during our lifetimes, Polaris will remain the North Star, but sometime way into the future, Polaris will no longer be the North Star, you know, it'll be a different star. And that is something that often we don't uh, realize. And I mentioned this because quite often we hear about constructions, you know, like uh, different civilizations in the past used the sky to orient their major buildings, you know, um, like even the, the, the Sphinx and the pyramids, they are supposed to be oriented in certain ways with respect to stars in the sky. And back then, of course, the stars were still the same, but the orientation would have been slightly different. You know, if they were using, you know, the, let's say the orient a building towards the North Star back then, they were oriented it towards Thuban, not towards Polaris. Okay, so that's something we need to take into account when we interpret the, the buildings and, you know, the civilizations, how they used the night sky back then. We also have to remember that the night sky looked slightly different, you know, oriented slightly differently to the civilizations back then. You know, these are interesting points. So when, um, when they talk about, you know, looking through some aperture in the roof of a building, they were able to see a star. That star would have been different back then. You know, when we're talking about 3000 BC, definitely the orientations of the stars was quite different from what we see today. So now that we have, going back to my presentation, now that we know how to orient ourselves uh, at night, you know, we've identified not. I, I started off with not because here in these Northern latitudes, if we want to look for action, you know, if we want to find out where the planets are, we don't look towards the north, we actually have to look towards the south, you know? So after having figured out where north is, do a 180 and face south, and that's where you'll find the planets. And that is because, it, because we are so uh, far north, the plane of the sun, along which all the planets also orbit, is two hours south, will always be two hours south. You know, the most north that the, sun travels is 23 and a half degrees and we're at 48 degrees north latitude. So to us, the sun and all the planets will always be, be to our south. So if you want to locate planets, look towards the south and here in the night sky, you know, I've kind of drawn a little line to, to orient, uh, you know, where that, uh, where the planets would lie. We call it the ecliptic, you know, so that is the path of the sun. In fact, it is the path of the Earth around the sun, you know, the, the orbital plane of Earth. But of course, we are standing on Earth. So to us, it looks as though the sun is going around us. And in the sky, the sun will be traveling along this, this invisible line, which we call the ecliptic. And because all the planets more or less lie on the same plane, they will also lie along the ecliptic. So if you're looking for planets, look along the ecliptic. And one good guide for that is the moon. The moon is not on the ecliptic because the moon has a slightly different plane of uh, travel, but it is very close to the ecliptic. You know, so where you note the moon, that's almost near where the ecliptic lies, as you see in this image. So once you know, know the moon, draw a little arc that goes from east to west, that would be the ecliptic. And looking along the ecliptic, if you see any bright spots, that's most likely a planet. And amongst all the planets, the ones which are visible to the naked eye are Venus, you know, which is the morning star or the evening star, Mars, which is quite reddish in color, uh, Jupiter and Saturn. You know, Jupiter is really bright, you know, the, the next brightest planet uh, compared to Venus and Saturn, has a slightly yellowish hue, not as bright as Jupiter, but also given its size, it doesn't blink. So that's another telltale clue in identifying Saturn. And Jupiter and Saturn most likely are summer planets. You know, they, they become visible towards midsummer and they stay in the sky till fall. Okay. Venus, of course, is visible either as a morning star or it's, it always is very close to the sun and appears either as a, in the mornings or late evening. 
you know, that's when, because otherwise the glare of the sun, you can't actually make out Venus. So those are the principal planets you can see in the sky. So now that we know where the ecliptic, ecliptic is, we'll be able to identify the planets. And along the ecliptic lie some of the principal constellations. You know, these are the constellations most of us are familiar with. And I should mention, you know, quite often uh, people ask me, you know, am I an expert in constellations? And definitely not, you know, in astronomy, uh, constellations are more like just maps, you know, they are of very little scientific interest and I'll kind of explain why that is so. But anyway, because uh, constellations form good uh, guides in the, in the night sky, I'd like to point out that along the ecliptic are the main constellations, the, the so-called zodiacal constellations, in the ones that mark the months, you know, the different months. Uh, and as you can see in this image here, um, up there is uh, are some of the constellations, at least I am able to identify, Cancer and Leo, and uh, I think uh, Virgo, you know, so, and on this side is Scorpio. So those are the zodiacal constellations. And because these constellations lie on the ecliptic, people have kind of associated months with each of these because they kind of pass, mark the passage of the year as they rise and, and set. So this image is midnight tonight. So Virgo apparently is probably associated with this month. I, I'm not sure, but that's the one that is going to be up at midnight. You know? So that's probably the, the constellation which is associated with, the, with this month. So if you're looking for constellations, again, the ecliptic is a good guide. You know, if you can locate the ecliptic, that's most likely where you'll find the main constellations that most of the people are familiar with. There are, of course, many other constellations which are elsewhere, but those are not the zodiacal constellations. So um, what, I'm, what I'm going to, uh, yeah, because we're talking about constellations, let me just uh, justify, I said, you know, constellations have very little scientific interest. And let me justify that using another constellation with which many of us are familiar. So this is Orion, you know, the hunter, the big constellation that is a winter constellation, you know, so right now Orion is not visible because it is kind of, it sets uh, soon after dusk. So we can't see Orion in the night sky, but it is a beautiful winter constellation. And, uh, the very clear way of identifying it is the three bright stars that form the belt of Orion and the little three slightly fainter stars below the belt, which is the sword of Orion. So uh, this is the constellation we are familiar with. And what I'm going to do now is deprojected. projected you know? So what we are seeing now is these stars projected on the, on the plane of the sky but in reality, these stars are all at different distances. You know, to us, when we look from Earth out into the sky, they appear to lie on the same plane. But in fact, from us, they're all at different distances. As you can see, you know, on this little image, the, the stars are kind of scattered throughout uh, space. But just because of our vantage, they appear to be clustered together. Okay? And the ancient people, connected the dots and made out a story to go with that. But in reality, they have little or no physical association. They're not even part of the same grouping of stars. Okay? So that's why I'm saying it's not just because they, they appear to be clustered in the sky that they have some kind of a scientific sign significance. They don't, you know, there are other clusters of stars which are physically clustered together and they interact with each other. We call them binary stars or open clusters and globular clusters, they have physical meaning and those we study in detail, but constellations are not physical associations. And so we don't have uh, you know, much interest in studying them in great detail. We use them more just to chart the sky. You know? So for instance, when we're talking about the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, where there is a massive, supermassive black hole, we call the black hole Sagittarius because it lies in the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. You know, it has nothing to do with the constellation Sagittarius. 
It's just because it lies in the direction of Sagittarius in the sky that we call the black hole Sagittarius A star. Okay, so, so astronomers normally use these constellations just to map the sky, as did the ancient navigators as well. Okay, so they, they used all these constellations more to pick their way uh, across on their long ocean voyages. Okay, so that was the, the main interest. So, and of course, you know, uh, I put up uh, uh, Orion because, you know, last year there was a big, uh, you know, the, one of the stars in Orion, Betelgeuse, made headlines because over a short period of time, it, its brightness changed dramatically. And what astronomers know now is it's a star that is nearing the end of its life. And so it goes through these cyclic variations and it looked like it went through a bigger oscillation than usual. And people were thought that it was about to explode, which it didn't, you know, so it's still, Betelgeuse is still up in the sky. Uh, yeah, so going, going back to our North Star, you know, so uh, I said, we'll be able to find the planets. So some of these maps that I've shown in this presentation, actually I've generated using a, a software called Stellarium. You know, this is a free software. I'm just, you know, there are many such software, free uh, software available on the internet. I just use Stellarium because that's one that I use quite often. And it's a very handy tool. And what is really, I just kind of show you a couple of uh, uh, things using Stellarium, uh, but you know, there are many other applications like that, which you could also use. So I'm just going to uh, stop the slideshow and then move to Stellarium just to kind of show you what, uh, what that looks like. So this is, you know, Stellarium, like I said, is just a virtual sky. It's an app. Um, it's very well made. It's a free software. And there's a nice way if you're interested in, in getting to know your night sky on any given night, you could just go into Stellarium, put in the date and time, and it'll show you what the sky will look like. And it'll also name the stars up there. So I thought it would be a nice thing for me to at least point out one of these apps that you could probably use uh, to get to know the night sky better. So what we have here uh, is the night sky on the 7th, uh, yeah, 7th of May. So earlier this, this month, I brought up the sky for earlier this month in order to show you two of the planets, you know, so just at dusk, Venus and Mercury, Mercury were visible uh, right now they're not visible any longer because they've kind of gone too close to the sun. So they basically set with the sun. But this is basically what Stellarium looks like. You kind of, uh, when you start the app, you can put in any date and time, and then it shows you the night sky. You can also let it run, you know, so it'll actually advance with the time, and then you'll see the passage of stars overhead. So what I'm now going to do is change the date so that I can show you two other planets you know, Jupiter and Saturn, those are visible in the early hours of the morning. You know, so if you want to see those planets, you'll have to wake up quite early uh, and then you'll be able to see them. So later on in the summer, they become visible, uh, you know, at some decent hour, like 10 o'clock at night, you know, so in July and August, they're beautifully visible in the night sky. Okay, so let me uh, move this forward a little. So let's go to let's say the end of the month. And then of course we need to, so as you can see, you know, there's Jupiter and Saturn. And as I mentioned, you know, all of them will lie along the ecliptic, you know, so you could just, um, once you identify the ecliptic, look along the ecliptic and most likely you'll be able, able to identify the stars. Okay, okay. so that's, that's where you, you look for planets. Um, the other thing I mentioned, was there a question? I'm sorry. Must have been something else. 
the other thing I mentioned was uh, looking for for uh, big constellations, and Stellarium has these little fancy features. So if you just click one of the buttons, it connects the dots and shows you where the constellations are. So on any given night, you can just look up, you know, where your where your favorite constellations are, and you can even ask them to. I think. So it kind of uh, fills the pictures and puts the names of these objects. It names the stars. So if you're interested in doing a little bit more of sky exploration, Stellarium is a nice handy tool to, to use. So like I said, this is one of many apps and you know I find this nice and handy. So feel free to uh, use it if you wish. So going back to our presentation, because I know, um, you know, we are running short on time, so I should not take too much of your time. Let me just wrap this up quickly with just a few more interesting points. Yeah, that's Stellarium. So why I pointed out Venus was Back then, even I'm talking about 400 years ago when Galileo first looked up at the sky with his very simple two inch telescope. One of the first objects he noticed was uh, Venus because of its brightness. And what he also noticed was that over a period of a, of a few months, Venus very much had faces, just like the moon had faces. And that is because Venus is what we call an inner planet between us and the sun. So as it goes around the sun, at one point in its orbit, we are able to see the dark side of the planet, you know, the, the side of the planet, which is not lit by the sun, very much like the dark side of the moon, because the, you know, of, its, of the proximity of the moon, we are able to see the dark side. So the same way, the only planet for which we can actually see the dark side in this, uh, the unlit side is Venus. And so at certain points in its orbit, it appears like a crescent moon. It has its faces. And that's what gave Galileo the clue that back then they thought the sun was going around the earth. And Galileo realized that that could not be and that the planets were the ones orbiting the sun and not the other way around. And that is because he realized that Venus was actually orbiting the sun just because of these faces of Venus, he deduced that Venus was a planet around the sun and not a planet around Earth. The other clue that uh, told him about um, planets was Jupiter. So even with a two inch telescope, you know, so with a pair of binoculars, you'll be able to see, if you look at Jupiter on a clear night, you'll be able to see four little bright dots next to Jupiter. Those are the brightest of the moons of Jupiter. So right now there are about 79 moons of Jupiter known. And of those, only the four brightest are visible through a small you know, pair of binoculars, a good set of binoculars or a small telescope. Galileo back 400 years ago was able to see them. And so we call them uh, uh, Galilean moons of Jupiter. So those are the four seen in this image and he did write about them in his notes. So Galileo made note of these. And what is spectacular about these four moons is if you watch the moons from one night to the next, you will see their positions changing. As they orbit Jupiter, their positions in the sky will change and you can actually see it. So just as a fun exercise, maybe the summer, look up at Jupiter over a period of week and every day at the same time, uh, and then just make a sketch of where Jupiter is and where the moons are, and you'll see that their positions change. Okay. Uh, and that's the other clue that taught uh, Galileo that Jupiter is another planet with its own moon system. You know, so it's not as though everything revolved around the Earth. And uh, you know, the the geocentric view that people held back then was wrong. And what we should be thinking about is the heliocentric or the sun-centered view of the solar system. So those are the four uh, bright moons, the Galilean moons, uh, Europa, Io, uh, Ganymede, and Callisto. And of those four moons, the one that I'm most interested in 
is Europa. And that is because Europa is just a big ball of ice. It, 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 has, it contains more water than the water we have on Earth. Um, and of course, given its distance from the sun, it re receives very little solar radiation. So most of the uh, water is frozen as ice. So it's a big ball of ice. But deep underneath, there is an ocean. There is a liquid ocean. And you know there are big plans. NASA is planning to send a space mission just to explore Europa. And that is because the, given uh, that there is liquid water, and we know that liquid water is one of the essentials for life. The other ingredient for life is warmth. And because uh, Europa is close to Jupiter, Jupiter's gravity is kind of kneading Europa, you know, very much like bread dough. And if you made bread, if you kneaded uh, bread dough, you know, it gets warm. The same way Europa's interior is getting kneaded by Jupiter and it produces warmth. So we have two of the essentials for life. So there is liquid water, there is warmth from this core of Europa. So given these two, is there a possibility of life? It's still an open question, which is why we have these space missions which are going to go and explore. And what they plan to do is there is a lot of volcanic or geysers on Europa spewing water. So they want to fly these spacecraft through these plumes, pick up a sample and look for microbial life and eventually put landers on Europa, you know, probably drill down and see if they can sample the water and detect life. You know? So even in the solar system, there is so much more uh, there is to be uh, explored and discovered. So I think uh, you know, that's my last slide. So uh, hopefully given you a few things to, to get started on your explorations of the celestial sphere. So I hope you will continue navigating those stars and learning more about uh, you know, this fascinating universe that is out there to, to explore and learn more on. Okay. And of course, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. So let me, um, let me stop at this point, you know, just put up a few more slides showing you the different things you can do with Stellarium. So, and this is our nearby, uh, our neighboring galaxy, Andromeda, you know, which is just visible to the naked eye. You know, it's a faint fuzzy object in the constellation Andromeda, you know, which is why we call it the Andromeda galaxy. So if you're kayaking and if you have a really dark spot, look towards Andromeda and you may be able to make out our neighboring galaxy, uh, Andromeda. Okay? That's at three and a half million light years. So it's some incredible. So the one thing you should remember is when I say three and a half million light years, if on a clear night you see Andromeda, you're seeing Andromeda as it was three and a half million light, three and a half million years back in time. Okay? So you're not seeing Andromeda as it is today but you're actually looking back in time at Andromeda this many uh, million years back in time. Okay, so an amazing feeling uh, when you think about it. Okay, so that's my last slide. You know, I'll just end where I, where I started, looking up at the night sky and just being thrilled by all these things that are out there to, to learn, learn about. Okay, so thanks again. And I'll be happy to take your questions. I've got a question, Karen. Amazing. Um, Fred, are you going to lead the questions? Yeah, thanks. Karen, where did the names that we currently call the planets come from? Were they from one original source or a variety of different places? So a variety of different places, you know, because back then planets could be uh, named after the discoverers. So people who discovered you know, like uh, Neptune and Uranus. So they were not, they're not visible uh, to the naked eye. So those were discovered later, you know, after all these uh, uh, brighter planets were discovered. So planets were named over a period of time and by different people as well, okay? I do not know all the history, but uh, they were not all named by the same person or the same source, you know, but they have become standard. They've been accepted as standard names. I'm definitely not, uh, you know, a historian to give you more uh, specific details, but that's a good question. You know, um, you can 
you can probably Google who, where these names come from. You know, some of them from ancient civilizations, but also several from later discoverers. I hope um, I answered your question. We have a question, I think, from Bob. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, do different cult, uh, Earth cultures have different um, constellations and stories? And we were traveling in uh, Lombok, Indonesia. We met people from Java, and they were uh, teaching their grandchildren about the Greek or European constellations that we're seeing here. But they were also teaching them about the stories and the shapes from their culture. Very much so, Bob. That's a that's a good question, and that is because the sky appears different where you are on Earth. You know, so the the sky that we see from forty eight degrees north, we see a patch of sky, which is quite different from what people at forty eight degrees south would see. You know, the, they wouldn't be able to see our constellations. You know, they're probably very low on the horizon. They could see a few constellations. So. And these constellations are very much tied to, like I said, because they're just projections, the stories that are associated with, with these constellations are kind of tied to the civilizations. You know, So different civilizations came up with slightly different constellations <clears throat> and mythologies and stories to go with them. We don't have to travel far. The, the first peoples here in Canada, each of those nations, they have their own constellations and stories to go with them. Even though they saw the same sky, they have their own individual constellations as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you made that point is we realize that what we're teaching in school is kind of very Eurocentric. Yeah. And so we're trying to break that mold now. So even in our introductory classes, we try to bring in the, the knowledge that exists within the First Nations here. You know, so they have studied the stars, they have their own uh, understanding of all these things. So we're trying to fold in not just this uh, Greek and Roman kind of a stories, but really showing how universal these stories are, and how the constellations are different, but at the same time unified in some ways as well. You know, so I'm glad you really asked the question. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question online from Helen. We'd like to hear about the Perseid um, meteor shower that we will usually see in August. Yeah, that's another good question. So these meteor showers are actually debris, space debris, uh, usually from shredded comets. Okay? So uh, comets are uh, celestial objects that, you know, um, are also orbiting the sun, but on very extended orbits. They come from the outer solar system. They're just big balls of ice and dust. And as they come close to the sun, the sun's radiation kind of ablates it, you know, kind of breaks up the comets. And some of these bigger comets, they break up into debris, which kind of trail along that same orbital direction. So they too, all the debris too, are orbiting the sun. And some of these debris trails intersect the Earth's orbital path, you know, so the Earth kind of passes through this debris belt. And at such times, some of this debris, because of the Earth's gravity, falls towards Earth. And as these, I'm talking of very tiny particles, you know, they, they're not the big asteroids that would, uh, that would wipe out dinosaurs. These are very small particles, but as they, fall through the Earth's atmosphere because of the friction, they burn up. And those are what we call the, the shooting stars. And during a, a, a comet shower like that, we see many more of them because there is this collection of debris. So there are many more uh, shooting stars, which we call, um, you know, like the Pleiades showers, you know, so during that short period of time, when both our um, orbits intersect, we have a few nights where there are many more shooting stars, and those are the Pleiades um, showers. We have Geminids and Leonids and all that. You know, these are all named after the month in which they occur. So yes, and Pleiades is probably the most spectacular. I have a question, um, Kalun. How are you going about the process of learning 
uh, the indigenous perspectives on the stars as the elders die off? How, what, is, what is the process exactly? I mean, do you have people that do like research projects within native communities or what? That's another excellent question and a very important question. And uh, okay. it, the answer is both, you know, so uh, because people have realized that many of the, much of the knowledge is being lost. Like when I lived in Hawaii, there was very much a revival in trying to preserve amongst the Hawaiians to try to preserve the, uh, the knowledge. And now they have these ocean going boats, which they have modeled based on historical records. And they try to recreate the voyages of the ancients, you know, and uh, collect the, gather the knowledge. Many of the young are inducted into the program and taught the ways just to preserve that knowledge. And the same is happening here in Canada as well. You know, many of the nations have elders who are passing on their knowledge to the, to the youngsters and preserving them. And we in the Western astronomical community, we reach out and you know, uh, the, we invite them to come and share the knowledge via presentations or via written records so that we can teach them in our classes. Okay, so hopefully it is not too late. Hopefully we, are, we will manage to preserve most of the knowledge but that is a very pressing need to do that, is to preserve it before all the elders pass on and we lose all this very important knowledge that needs to be preserved and passed on. Yeah, it's happening, you know, so definitely it's happening on both sides. Yes, I have a question. You. Uh, you mentioned that the Earth's axis uh, is pointing in the direction of Polaris, but that it's not uh, stable and that it's going to shift in some future date, probably I, I'm not going to be there. <laughs> but uh, is that a gradual shift yes. or, or steady shift or is there some events that create the shift that, uh, uh, during that process? Yeah, another good question. It is a continuous shift. Okay, so when I mentioned these kind of a uh, major stars like Tuban and Vega, these were just like milestones in its path, but it is a continuous shift. And to give you an idea of how it happens, in astronomy, we have some of these brighter objects are cataloged, and every year there is a new catalog that is put out. You know, we call it an astronomical almanac, which mm -hmm. contains the positions of many thousands of objects. Uh, using almost like on a map, you know, the, we have latitude and longitude. In astronomy, we, we have what is called right ascension and declination. And the right ascension and declination of all these objects is updated every year just because of this precession. Okay. So because it is a continuous uh, change, we need to keep up with that change. Otherwise, when we point our, our telescope at the sky, we won't even be looking at that object. It may have moved out of the field of view. Okay, so it's a constant motion, very much think of a slowly spinning down top, you know, so it is that kind of a motion that, uh, that, that is similar to the Earth's procession. Okay. So we correct these almanacs every year for procession because yes, it's a constant but ongoing. Don't those almanacs after a period of time cycle back into the uh, uh, same readings? <laughs> many, many, many thousands of years later. Yeah, all right. Like okay. said, yeah, from Polaris to Vega is 12 centuries. You know, Vega right. is, really, yeah, so it's a very long time. And okay. yes, at some point, <laughs> way yeah. into the future, we could reuse yeah. the Hallman Axe of 2021, for instance. Okay. Yes, it, I think the overall period is about 30, 30 centuries, 30,000 years is how long it takes for the Earth to process around once. Mm. Okay. I don't know if anyone here travels to the uh, region regions closer to the equator, but one of the thing, a thrilling experiences that I had was um, through having the immense opportunity to sail to Hawaii. And once you got beneath a certain latitude, you could see the scorpion uh, 
constellation, which I noticed in your imagery, was very close to the equator or what was within our range of view. I'm wondering how far south you have to go. It's, it's a number of years ago now, and I can't quite remember where I was when I saw it. I just remember it was magnificent. I was yes, wondering so how south you go. How to see scorpion up yeah. in the sky very well? Yeah, the closer you go to equator, the higher the ecliptic becomes. And at the equator, the ecliptic will be directly overhead. You know, so all the zodiacal constellations will go towards you directly overhead. You know, that's, you'll get the best view there. I see. And then as you go further south, the constellations will be more towards, the zodiacal constellations will be more towards the north. And if you're at 48 degrees south latitude, you will have the same sky, but upside down. You know? So <laughs> the ecliptic will be towards your north. You know, so that's how it is. Thank you. Yeah. And that's why, you know, going back to the question about constellations, that's why the stories are different, the constellations are different. Um, and, you know, one of the, in one of our astronomy labs, there is an exercise where students, we teach them how to identify constellations and we give them a little bit of details regarding these constellations. And for their reports, they have to go and find uh, constellations from other civilizations, you know, or, you know, like I said, there, are, there is such a huge variety of those and associate the Western constellations with the constellations or the stories from this other civilization, just to see how people viewed the sky and how they uh, put those stories together. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Oh, hi, it's Ian. Um, I had one question. I, I was watching a, um, an interview with Neil Armstrong last night on YouTube by coincidence, and he talked about how the moon was not uniform. It was dust here, hard mountains there, different colors. And, and we tend to look at planets as uniform uh, bodies. But in fact, are, are they uniform? Are they, are they incredibly varied? Is Saturn full of uh, varied surfaces and are they all very different with, or are they very simple planets or as uniform as Earth, as, as varied as Earth? As varied as Earth and even more so in some cases. So as we, as we are now discovering on Mars, you know, we have all these rovers on Mars which are, which are exploring the surface of Mars and you know they're finding that the surface is so varied, um, the soil composition, uh, the age, and going back to your another your question about the moon. So back, what we understand about the moon is that early in the Earth's history, the Earth suffered a giant impact from a major asteroid. You know, so this was big enough to blow out part of the young Earth's mantle and the debris that came off the earth then due to self-gravity collapsed and formed the moon. So back in the, in the history of earth, moon was part of earth. Okay, so it now is an independent body. And this has been uh, proven because they have brought back moon samples and they have you know, verified that the composition is very much like earth's. You know? So we know that this theory kind of uh, is very plausible and when the moon was formed, gravity is a crushing force. You know, it just pulls things together, heats things up. So when the moon was very young, it had volcanoes. So it had a lot of lava flows. So the discoloration that we see when we look up at the moon, the dark spots and the white spots, they are in fact very different in composition. You know, some of them are old basaltic flows, lava flows, and there are other places where these are impact craters from asteroids impacting the moon, which has blown subsurface material onto the surface. So that's the lighter patches that we see. So the outer surface of the moon is also very varied and you can make it out just from the number of craters we see on the moon surface. And in fact, if you go to the far side of the moon, side that we cannot see because the moon is kind of 
held by Earth's gravity, so it cannot spin around uh, its axis. You know, it just the same side of the moon faces the Earth all the time, but the far side of the moon is very heavily cratered. You know, so it's taken a lot of bombardment, which has given rise to a very featured surface. You know, so it has, and the same applies to every planet. You know, look at Venus; it has a very thick atmosphere made up of carbon dioxide. And recently there was talk of probably there is microbial life high in the atmosphere of Venus. So every planet is full of mysteries and many, many things that we'd like to find out. You know, So of course, there are lots of space missions happening now. So we're beginning to piece these stories together, but the story is definitely not complete. You know, So there is a lot more to learn and every planet is very varied and full of mysteries. So if, you, if you're interested, uh, an ongoing mission, of course, other than uh, the rovers on Mars, you know, which make the, the news stories all the time, we also have um, a spacecraft going around Jupiter called Juno. So if you just Google NASA and J-U-N-O, Juno, there are some spectacular pictures that have come back. And Jupiter is a gas giant, you know, so it's just made up mainly of methane and helium and you know so it's it the composition is very different from the composition of earth it has a very strong magnetic field has northern lights you know a rural activity so yeah another mysterious planet which we haven't explored very much you know we're trying to do that the same with saturn uh, so yeah the, there are many, many things to, to find out about the planet still. And we haven't yet explored Uranus and Neptune and all that. So a yeah, lot more to learn. It seems that questions are continuing on here. I see Don Scott has his hand raised. Don, is that a clap or a question? Uh, it's a question. And uh, just turn on this thing here, wait a second. Um, what I'm wondering about is how did, do people, and especially in, in this case, I guess mostly the police, Polynesians and the Inuit in the far north, how did they use the stars to navigate? The, I mean, the, the constellations and the stars, they don't essentially move compared to the movement of them in kayaks or boats or, or on foot. Uh, how, how do they know where they are on earth in relationship to and using the stars to do that. So, yeah. Very puzzling. <laughs> that, I that's another I'm, whole lecture, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I definitely am not the person to answer that question, you know, because I would love to learn more about that knowledge is just immense. You know, they, they observe the stars. So from an astronomer's point of view, what I can say is the sky you see is dependent on the time of the year. Like I said, you know, constellations rise and set and the constellations you see in different seasons are different. And that is because as the earth goes around the sun, our night sky, you know, what we see at night is constantly changing You know, the patch of the sky that we see. So they must have observed these stars over a period of many, many, many years so that they have a map of given a certain time where a constellation is and like I said, they must have used things like the Big Dipper to orient themselves at night so that they know where north is and you know, which direction the other cardinal points are. So there must have been a combination of these factors that they must have used during the navigation. Plus, of course, they also understood the ocean currents very well, you know, just based on the direction of the waves, the direction of the wind, they used all these factors during the navigation. So it wasn't just the stars, they used a combination of many, many things. And I definitely am you know, very ignorant about all the techniques that they used. You know, so mine is just uh, you know, a tiny bit about what the stars are, but how they put all this knowledge together to navigate is just fascinating. Mm -hmm. That it is, thank you very much. It's been a great talk, Karun, much appreciated. Okay. My pleasure. Thank you for saying that. Yes, we have a lot of positive comments in the chat as well, Kara, about your talk and about how much people have enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Um, now, if we have um, any more questions. Otherwise, we're getting close to the end of our time. And uh, I'm sure uh, you're getting a bit tired answering. But 
anymore? I, I never tire of astronomy. <laughs> oh, oh, wow, wonderful. We'll keep you here all night then. <laughs> I'm an astronomer. I'm quite used to staying up all night. <laughs> Can I ask one funny question? Um, I, I, I happened to watch First Man, the landing of the moon on the plane from England yesterday. And um, they, they were showing, remember, we, all, we were all at that age. We all saw Neil Armstrong coming down on the moon. Well, I work in television, and we sometimes can't get a signal from one side of Vancouver Island to the other. And I still wonder how they managed to get a signal from the moon right the way down to Earth in live time in 1969. Amazing technology. And that's my question is. <laughs> yeah, they managed they to do, do that? that. Yeah. So for sure, you know, they, they, the uh, communication technology was good enough that they could communicate with the astronauts during their flight. You know, that is even more important is to make sure that um, flight control in, in Houston was able to uh, keep track of the health and safety of the astronauts to, throughout the flight. So I don't know about the technology, you know, I don't know what kind of technology is needed for these transmissions, but the, the technology has since then evolved to uh, a great extent. And, you know, the one of the um, spacecraft launched in the 1970s, the Voyagers one and two, those are the ones which are still communicating. You know, they have left the solar system, they are in interstellar space, but they're still sending out weak signals. You know, so I think Voyager 1 is still able to send a very weak signal back to Earth. And we're talking about billions of kilometers away. So uh, again, I don't know much about the technology, but definitely they had excellent technology in order to communicate. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, with, uh, with the astronauts in, on, on the moon. I'd like to ask how it's decided that life needs water or hydrogen or has to be carbon-based, for instance. And aren't we being a little bit sort of solar system-centric or Earth-centric when we decide those things? That's a good point. And, uh, Something that we need to keep in mind is, you know, the life forms that we know of may not be the only life forms nature is capable of. And we know that evolution is such an amazing, amazing machine. You know, it just, uh, it just is driven by, uh, by survival. And so it could, there could be life forms that we have no idea, you know, how they, they function. I know, I've read a report about, I think there is a microbe uh, in some lake water in the, in the US that had managed to synthesize arsenic in, into its DNA structure. So you're quite right, you know, we are in for many more surprises, but when we do these searches, we base them on something that we understand, you know, so we have to build some instrumentation and the, when we build the instrumentation, we need to have some goals, you know, what are the things that we need to detect in order to probably find life that we understand and the things that we have seen with life on earth is, you know, uh, an ability to, uh, yeah, or the need for liquid water, a need for some so source of heat. Um, and yeah, that's what uh, these searches are based on. But you're quite right, you know, we may be missing something else. Um, and that we will learn as, as we progress on, you know, so that's the way science works is we, uh, we sort of start off with certain axioms, we push forward, we see where the theory fails, we go back to the drawing board, come up with new axioms, and then try to push forward, forward, a little bit at a time, slipping a couple of steps along the way, but that's the way science works, you know, so you raise a very important and uh, good point regarding the kind of one-sided view, but we need to start somewhere. Well, thank you very much. And I think uh, um, I'm gonna ask Fred to formally finish our meeting. Ah. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Karen, thank you very much for a very informative and um, interesting talk tonight. I know when I've been out on numerous kayak trips, and I'm lying on a beach on my back 
before moonrise and I'm looking up in the sky, I'm not only overwhelmed, but I'm confused about what I've seen. Um, my skill set uh, stopped after finding the North Star. So uh, everything that you shared tonight was new information for me. And the next time I find myself on my back on a beach like that, I'm going to try some of the things that you suggested. So thank you very much for what you shared with us. Plus, as a small way of saying thank you, um, I'll connect with you offline. And I've got a, um, a Cisco mug, much sought after and much desired by everybody on the earth. So uh, I'll make sure that it gets delivered to you. So again, thank you very much. And Lynn, back to you. Thank you, Rob. And yeah, my pleasure indeed. You know, like I said, I'm very passionate about astronomy and it is always thrilling to share what little I know about astronomy with, uh, with public like you who are interested in learning. You know, so thank you so much for, for this invitation. And oh, thank I, you for that cup. You know, the next time I have to stay up all night looking up at the stars, I'll definitely take it along and I'll remember your comment. Well, and thank you very much. And uh, this has been, I think, a wonderful end of our winter members meetings um, and a wonderful introduction to our opportunities to get out this summer and uh, practice some of what we've learned from you. I really want to thank you. And uh, hopefully you can come kayaking at some point in time. Because it's, it's an amazing way to see the skies. Indeed, indeed, I will. Thank you, Lynn. All right. And I think night, I will try to make sure we, we publish your um, fall um, Wednesday sessions. And they're every Wednesday, are they? Yes. Through our summer. meetings are only the, the, you know, are only once a month. So ah. there's lots of opportunity for people to come. And attend. Well, please, yeah, be really nice to see you all. Uh, it, it happens every Wednesday night throughout the year, you know. So, please do come. It's in uh, the UVic Observatory is in the Bob Wright Building on campus. So mm -hmm. Wednesday nights, seven thirty uh, during most of the year, and eight o'clock in the summer, just to coincide with the later sunset. Uh, we are online at the moment. But we'll be going face to face this fall, you know, provided everything, uh, the pandemic situation continues improving and, you know, we are able to have face to face uh, observatory open houses. Mm -hmm. So it will be a pleasure to invite you all. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thanks, to everyone who um, we're all still here. It's been a great evening. I can just see everyone was fascinated. So thank <laughs> you all and have a lovely evening. Thank you, Lynn. Bye. Have a great summer, everyone. Take care. Be safe out there. <laughs>